Hi folks, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Today, I wanna to talk about a paper from the latest Usenix annual technical conference. And this is a really interesting paper because this talks about how serverless workloads actually perform in the real world. The great thing about this paper is that the authors are from Microsoft and they have actually shared some workload characteristics of the Microsoft Azure function as a service. And usually this kind of real production characteristic data is pretty hard to come by. So why is that so interesting? Well, first of all, just for its own sake, it's interesting to learn about what the characteristics of these workloads are in the real world. But once you know these workload patterns, you can then use that knowledge to better design algorithms for serving these patterns. The goal is to be able to run these functions in a way that they serve quickly, but also use as few resources in terms of RAM and CPU as possible. The main problem we want to solve when serving these functions is to have them start up quickly and serve quickly. You want to give the illusion that they are already in memory. Of course, you can't do that because if you kept them in memory all the time, that would be prohibitively expensive. And the cloud provider is only billing for the duration that these functions execute. On the other hand, if they're always out of memory and you load them up on demand, you're going to pay a heavy latency penalty for the cold start. And so you wanna balance these two things. You wanna be able to load the function, have it do a warm start while not keeping it in memory all the time. What cloud providers currently do is use a very simple keep alive policy. And what this does is for every invocation of a function, it keeps that function in memory for the next few minutes. For AWS, that's 10 minutes. For Azure, it's 20 minutes. And this is simple, it's easy to understand, it's easy to implement, but the problem is that this policy is static and it does not use any information about that specific function's actual invocation frequency or the patterns in its invocation. What the authors in this paper do is characterize these workloads and with that knowledge, they design a better policy for keeping these functions in RAM in a way that reduces cold starts, but also reduces resource usage. Let's get into the statistics and the usage patterns that they found. This first one is the most basic one and it shows the distribution of the number of functions per application. And not just per application, but also in terms of number of invocations. And you can see that almost half of all applications have only one function and 95% of applications have less than 10 functions. And there's a tiny fraction of applications, about 0.04%, that have more than 100 functions. So most applications tend to have a small number of functions. The next thing to look at is the statistics for how these functions are invoked. And you can see that 55% of these functions are invoked via HTTP triggers, and that accounts for nearly a third of all invocations. The next big source of invocations is queue triggers, which account for only about 15% of functions, but again, a big fraction, about a third of all invocations. Then you have timers, which are 15% of all the functions, but account for only 2% of all invocations. And here you can see the popularity, so to speak, of the various trigger types with counts of apps that have at least one of each trigger. So we have 64% of apps that have at least one HTTP trigger, and we have about 30% of apps that have at least one timer trigger. So here you can see the types of triggers sorted by how commonly they are used. And this graph is really interesting. It shows the invocation frequency over time for, it looks like about a two week period. Now this is normalized to the peak. The peak is one. And you can clearly see daily and weekly patterns in this graph. But the interesting thing to note is that the valley is about half of the peak. So there's significant variation between the least loaded time and the most loaded time. 
And this graph shows the daily invocations and the average time interval between invocation as a cumulative distribution function. So you can see in terms of the number of invocations, there's a wide range, almost eight orders of magnitude. But you can see that the majority of applications and functions are invoked pretty infrequently. They found that 45% of them are invoked less than once per hour on average, and 81% are invoked once per minute or less on average. The other interesting statistic is how much the most popular apps and functions skew this distribution. So if you look at this graph and the x-axis is on a log scale, you can see that around here, if you look at the 10% most popular functions, they account for almost 99% of all function invocations. The next most important thing in terms of scheduling these functions to optimize for resource usage is to look at the variability in their frequency of invocation. So this graph looks at the IAT, the inter-arrival time of functions, and their coefficient of variation which is just the standard deviation divided by the mean. A CV of zero means the inter-arrival time is perfectly periodic and hence perfectly predictable. And you can see that there is a significant range in this coefficient of variation. So they're not easy to predict. The next interesting thing to look at is the distribution of function execution times. And again, you can see a pretty skewed distribution. We see that half of all functions execute for less than a second, and 90% of them execute for at most 60 seconds. The main takeaway from this is that function execution times are very similar to cold start times. This means that we really want to reduce or eliminate cold start times because they have a huge impact on the overall serving latency of these functions. So those were some of the statistics from real life function as a service workloads. Next, the authors want to use those statistics to come up with better scheduling algorithms for these functions. And they use two main parameters in order to do that. The first one is what they call a pre-warming window. The pre-warming window is how long you wait since the last execution before you expect the next invocation and load it into RAM. If you have a much larger value for this, of course you will reduce resource usage, but you may also cause some cold starts. The next major parameter is what they call the keep alive window. And this is the amount of time during which an application's image is kept live in RAM after it has been loaded or after an execution has happened. Of course, the longer you have this keep alive window, the more you will reduce cold starts, but also the more RAM you will use. And at a very high level, what the authors are proposing here is to notice the history of invocation of each function for some initial time. And once you have that, you can build a histogram of the frequency of that function's invocation. And then once you have that histogram, they use these two percentiles, the fifth percentile and the 99th percentile to decide on the length of time that they will pre-warm and keep alive these functions. And they implemented this scheduling policy and simulated its effect on historical traces of function invocation and what they found was this compared to the 10 minute fixed keep alive policy reduced cold starts and also used the same amount of memory as before. So what they found was the keep alive policy had two and a half times more cold starts while using the same amount of memory as their histogram based approach and they have implemented this scheduling policy in Azure, and they're rolling this out to production around the same time that this paper was published. All right, so to wrap up, in this paper we saw real production workload characteristics for 
a function as a service workload. And then the authors used these characteristics to shape a new scheduling algorithm for these functions that reduces cold start time without spending a ton of extra RAM. So I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.